Um, so uh, now I'd like to hand over to uh, Tony Juniper from uh, Natural England. Um, and uh, after that, we will have the panel discussion. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm sorry I didn't arrive for the early part of the conversation, but it's great to pick up some of the presentations that have occurred since and just to get a flavour of what people have been doing since they joined this course. In my case, it was some time ago. Uh, I came to uh, join the master's course here in 1987, 87-88. Uh, and just as a matter of interest, who actually wasn't born in 1987? How many hands? Good grief. <laughs> that makes me feel very old. Um, and actually, my career in conservation began a bit before that, in 1984. Um, after I graduated um, from Bristol in 83, I, I, I kind of approached the choices in front of me. I thought, am I going to go to academia and follow a science degree in zoology with some kind of PhD, or am I going to do something more kind of applied? And I thought, I've got to do conservation, because I'd grown up as a, as a naturalist, and uh, really, as you learn about the natural world as a kid, you realise what terrible peril it faces. And so that was my um, choice, was to move towards that side uh, of the agenda. And like everybody who enters into that kind of work, you find it's quite hard to get a position, pretty tricky to start building a career. I did have um, one year working, however, with the Wildlife Trust in Oxfordshire on a conservation project working with kids in primary schools, and that was fantastic. But after that, it was quite hard to, to find a place where you could see a long-term uh, future in the work. And I moved back to Bristol uh, for a couple of years. I was doing voluntary work, trying to get a bit of contract work here and there, uh, and applied at that point uh, to come and read the Conservation Master's course here. And there were very few opportunities like that at the time in this country, and I considered myself very fortunate to be uh, invited to come to London and spend a year on the conservation course. And I have to say, looking back on that year, that was the turning point for me. Um, it was a big change in the prospects that I had. Not only did I get to spend time here and going on field courses, but also met a lot of people who subsequently then uh, I worked with uh, post the course for a little period before then joining BirdLife International in Cambridge uh, in 1989. Uh, it was the International Council for Bird Preservation in those days and uh, we were having a discussion about whether we needed a better name and, and we did have a better name in the end, BirdLife International and that amazing partnership that Martin described harnessed behind that new banner. And I was uh, invited to go there to be the parrot conservation officer. Uh, the most endangered group of, birds of, of, group of birds in the world at the time, 350 species globally, uh, about 100 of them were listed as uh, in danger of disappearing one way or the other, many of them critically endangered. And so this was a very intensive period um, of understanding, going on a very strong learning curve about the threats faced by these birds and what could be done to save them. Tropical deforestation was one half of it. The other half of it, broadly speaking, was the collection for the bird trade, both illegal uh, and legal. And during the course of, of that work, um, I actually got into a little bit of campaigning. I didn't really mean to, uh, but we had a development officer there called Mike Parr, who, who uh, was very interested in the media and, and fundraising and how you put these things together. And we decided to run a campaign called Protect the Parrots, which was really about inviting anyone who wanted to own such a bird to get one from captive bread sources rather than from the wild. Uh, and this led to an amazing amount of interest in the media and politics because parrots, everyone knows what they are. Uh, you know, you, you can um, show many people different tropical birds and they haven't got a clue what you're talking about, but parrots, everyone got it. And so that was um, a really important moment for me because during the course of that time at BirdLife International, I was broadening my view about what the real problems were in conservation. And, in the case of those birds, it was tropical deforestation, which was the big deal. And in 1990, Friends of the Earth advertised uh, the role of senior tropical rainforest campaigner to work through the Friends of the Earth International Network, based here in London, with Friends of the Earth England and Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, to lead that team. And I moved there to run that work uh, in 1990, and went from being in a science-based organisation to one that was all about politics and campaigning and strategy and getting in the media and putting pressure uh, on companies and governments. And that was an incredible um, experience for me. 
and uh, led me into a different trajectory to the one that I thought I, I might be in. And as Martin said earlier on, you know, you never really know where this work's going to take you. And that took me into a place that I wasn't expecting. I did three years of that, um, some amazing campaigns we did that I do believe made a difference. Um, but in 1993, Friends of the Earth had a terrible financial crisis, and so we had to reorganize the organization, pare it down, and I was then uh, transferred into running a bigger team that included the UK biodiversity as well as the global piece linked to deforestation, and was then brought back into what was familiar territory for me, having been on this course, which was about the conservation of habitats and species uh, in the British Isles. And having become familiar with the regime here, sites of special scientific interest and all these uh, designations we have, and then moving into a role that also embraced that. And we ran some fantastic campaigns during that period, uh, including the anti-road protests during the middle 90s. Um, having seen how many of you uh, are very young, you may not remember that directly, uh, but it was a, a very intensive period where we were ramping up the environmental agenda, leading ultimately to the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, and I was working very closely with Craig on all of that work, and Martin at Wildlife and Countryside Link, and uh, we made a lot of progress in raising public awareness, raising the political profile, and ultimately getting an Act of Parliament that closed quite a lot of the loopholes that were still permitting the destruction of even protected sites in this country. Following that, uh, I finished up as the campaigns director at Friends of the Earth. We ran campaigns on genetically modified crops, uh, on over-abstraction of, of water, on industrial pollution, and then we began to get into climate change. And then uh, in that period, I finished up being the executive director of Friends of the Earth in this country and ran all sorts of um, initiatives, including the one which I think was my proudest achievement in that period uh, working in that organisation, which was the passage of the um, Climate Change Act uh, of 2008, which was the first legislation of its kind in the world, uh, which was based on, on a Friends of the Earth campaign that turned into a big coalition uh, effort subsequently, but got that over the line. Uh, and by that point, I was feeling quite tired. I'd done 18 years of this pretty intensive frontline campaigning, so decided to step out of that work and to embark on, on a more flexible portfolio kind of existence, you might call it. And so I was very fortunate to fall into a number of things at once, including uh, working with Craig uh, at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, where he'd already moved to. So I joined him as a, as a, as a fellow, so not working on the staff, but helping contribute to some of the programs. At the same time, uh, a, a friend was setting up a consultancy working with large companies, advising them on sustainability, so I, I, I chucked my hat in there as a partner with that, and also um, was invited to help His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales on some of his sustainability initiatives, including working with his rainforest project, which then turned into his sustainability unit, and then also writing a book with him called Harmony, which was published a couple of years later in 2010. And so I spent 10 years in that kind of mixed kind of portfolio, traveling all over the world, working with major companies, helping the Prince of Wales, working with the team at Cambridge. I also finished up being the president of the Wildlife Trusts uh, in that period. And um, that then got similarly intense to the point where I was feeling like I'm back at Friends of the Earth. I can't cope with this anymore. I've got to have a bit of a breather. So I thought I'm going to get a job again. I'm going to go back to one organization. And I had a phone call from the people at WWF who were looking for the uh, new uh, head of advocacy and campaigns at WWF UK. And they said, would you like to be considered for that? And I thought, well, why not? It's time to go back and do something uh, which is a bit more focused. And so I was very pleased to join the WWF team in this country. And I was there for about 18 months. And um, what happened is I was at a seminar in Cambridge during, it was the early stages of the Das Gupta review on the uh, economics of biodiversity. And uh, one of the Natural England team, who I'd known for years, he said, why don't you apply for the chair role at Natural England? I said, well, they'd never have me. I'm an old campaigner. Governments don't like old campaigners. He said, you may be surprised. And I was, uh, because I <laughs> sent an application, and they said, yes, come to an interview. And Michael Gove was Environment Secretary at the time, uh, and he is um, a creative, big thinker, wanted something different, and so they asked me to come and chair Natural England, which I took that role on three years ago, and I just began the second term. You get two terms of three years. I did the first one. Amazingly, I survived that, and I've just begun the second one. Uh, and uh, that is my principal activity at the moment, although I'm still doing some work with the Cambridge outfit that I began working with when Craig was there 
um, 12, 14 years ago, Craig, probably, something like that. So um, I, I find myself um, having, therefore, been in the NGO world, working with business quite a bit, uh, having uh, some experience of government, including now on the inside. And so what can I say to you that um, might be some kind of headline reflections about all of this? Um, so the first thing I, I must say um, about the work we do is that we've got to get it out of the ghetto. We've got to mainstream the recovery and the restoration of the natural world out of the environment box and out of the conservation box. And we've got to get it into planning, into agriculture, into transport policy, and crucially into the economics ministries, the treasury in this country. Because if we don't do that, we're always going to be um, chasing behind this tide of destruction. We've got to get in front of the wave and be part of the change that's coming from within those other economic uh, pieces of government and parts of the economy uh, that currently are often seeing the uh, nature side as something which is a distraction for somebody else to do. They've got to own it, otherwise it won't work. And that brings me to my second point, which is about narrative. Uh, we often talk about nature and the environment uh, in a way which I think to many people, it doesn't strike them as being what they need to deal with. And it goes back to my point a moment ago. And this is one reason why I spent quite a lot of time over uh, a few years ago writing a lot about the economic and social value of nature. Not just that it's beautiful and it needs to be protected for its own sake, but because if we don't restore the natural environment, there will be a collapse of civilization economic decline and social chaos. That's the reality of it. And there's all sorts of examples that we know about, from pollinators to soil health to climate stability to water security. All of these things depend on healthy nature. That narrative must be embedded in the mainstream, and it's beginning to happen, and it's starting to change the way people think. My third point, alongside mainstreaming and narrative, is about partnerships. We can never do what we need to do without working in collaboration right across the piece, and not just amongst the conservation groups working together, but with the private sector, those multinationals, um, across the um, financial sector, the pension funds and the hedge funds. How can we get these people involved? It's beginning to occur, but we need to really prioritise that work, to really build those partnerships and collaborative platforms, otherwise we will not succeed. My fourth point is about the limits of science and evidence. It's vital. It is the thing that drives the arguments into places where you have unavoidable conclusions. But those conclusions, even though they're un unavoidable, they only stick if they are a political priority or a business priority. So turning the uh, question into something which is gonna get social traction and political traction is really quite critical. This has been said by various people earlier on. We've gotta get the public involved, we've gotta get people caring, because that's how you get these questions pushed up into the boardroom and into the finance ministries and into where the Prime Minister is making decisions. And so that's often about public communications and engaging people. You might call it the blue planet effect, it's just incredible effect coming from one TV programme a few years ago, um, it's just one example, um, but making the vivid connections between plastic and the state of the marine environment, driving a whole lot of action uh, across companies and governments across the world. So that kind of thing is absolutely critical for us to, to do. And of course goes to some of the points Tom was making about the importance of communications. So there's a few little headings in terms of things that I think are important for us to master. Uh, I just finished with a personal reflection, and that is about the importance of purpose. Um, because you will go off into many different roles in the conservation sector. Many of you will have brilliant careers. You'll be standing here in 30 years' time telling us about the incredible things that have occurred. And you will do it not just because you had a fantastic training here, but you will do it because you personally had that goal inside you to do everything you could to avoid the catastrophe that's unfolding around us. That's what's driven me, and I think it will drive all of you into those very productive places as well, and you can all do it. We will all make that difference. I just want to close just with, a, with a, just a reflection about this course, actually, because you've heard from some people today who've done some brilliant things, not only in this country, but globally. I feel extremely fortunate to have had that year here, because I said to you, it was a turning point for me that led to so many other things. And, um, you know, the UCL course, I think, really, um, if you look at the way conservation has evolved over the years, and now moving into this new narrative of nature recovery, actually, I've, conservation, we need to stop that word and start talking about nature recovery. One of the reasons why we have had this um, 
this period of, of relative progress is because of this course. So I thank all the tutors and people who've made this work over many, many years. It's really made a significant difference. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. And we're going to have a Thank you.